On today's podcast, we are privileged to have the interview with the great, legendary radio DJ, Nick Harcourt. Nick, as you guys in Los Angeles may remember, was the music director for KCRW for many, many years. He really helped elevate KCRW, and it became an extremely influential station, not only in public radio circles, but also in Hollywood, where, you know, so many music supervisors were listening to his show for ideas for, you know, the new music that you couldn't get anywhere else. We talk about his career in radio. We talk about the future of broadcasting. We talked about his sense of where does his taste come from. And we talked about his transition into artist management, as well as the future of radio broadcasting. It's a really, really interesting interview. You don't want to miss it. Insiders, are you ready? Welcome to Mubu TV's Insider Podcast, where our mission is to educate, empower, and engage artists and music business professionals who are dedicated to having a successful career in the new music industry. Here are your hosts, Rich Ezra and Eric Knight. Welcome back, insiders, to another episode of the Mubu TV Insider Podcast, where our mission is to educate, empower, and engage your music career. On today's episode, we sat down and spoke with the legendary radio DJ and now artist manager, Nick Harcourt. We discuss his musical taste, programming choices, as well as his time as KCRW's very influential music director, as well as the future of broadcast radio and his decision to go into artist management and much, much more. You don't want to miss it. But first, a word from our sponsor. Hey, insiders. Are you looking to take your music career to the next level? Then you need to know about the Music Business Registry. The Music Business Registry is the leading music industry publisher of the most up-to-date contact information for major and independent record label A&R, music publishers, artist managers, music attorneys, music supervisors, and much, much more. The Music Business Registry is the trusted industry standard and source serving the music business community for over 28 years with the most accurate and up-to-date contact information available. Their titles include the a r Registry, the Film and Television Music Monthly, the Music Publisher Registry, and the Music Attorney Registry. All of their publications are available in print, PDF, CSV, or online subscription. Visit them now at musicregistry.com and receive a 10% discount by using coupon code MUBUTV10 at checkout. That's musicregistry.com, coupon code MUBUTV10. When you're ready to put your music to work, musicregistry.com. Welcome back, Insiders. Today's special guest on our featured interview is none other than the great Nick Harcourt. For those of you who are KCRW fans or who know of, you know, his work in radio, this is a real treat. I came to know Nick, I guess, about 10, 12 years ago when he was at KCRW. KCRW, for those of you who don't know, is one of the leading public radio stations in Los Angeles. And Nick was the music director there for many, many years influential station. Very influential stations. And, you know, we talked about the role of KCRW and the role that it had on radio and, you know, what his criteria was for selecting music for the station to play. And, you know, also a lot of other interesting things like how streaming has changed the discovery process for him. I mean, This was the guy who was, you know, he played the Doves, he played Coldplay, he played Nora uh, Jones Jones for the very first time. Yeah, Yeah. helped break them. I mean, they he was the very first, you know, station in the country to play them when no one else was. And you know, we got into some interesting things like, you know, what elements make a great song, in his opinion, and the future of radio. And so I think that you know, for any of you that are wondering, you know, how are these selections made by a real tastemaker? Um, this is a great insightful conversation into that process and into the thought process that goes into those choices. I couldn't agree more. I mean, I would say the definition of a curator is Nick Harcourt. Absolutely. He is the epitome of it. Um, what I thought and really loved about the interview too, was what he was talking about as well too, about trying to find the sights and sounds of what was going on in the region, like here in Los Angeles and being turned on to a lot of the Latin alternative, which he broke as well too. Absolutely. One of the acts that I work with in Universal, Bajo Fondo was a, was a living example of that. Um, and also, you know, his his transition into management because he does do management as well too. That's yes, as well as radio, exactly. It, yeah, and 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 just his uncanny knack to find these left of center acts and and go with them and choose them and give them a chance and you know his track record is is 
is unpack- is impeccable. Exactly, and it speaks for itself. And you know, during his time at KCRW, he became one of the most influential music sources at labels, at uh, you know, among music supervisors and among other public radio stations who really looked to what KCRW was playing to help them with their program choices. So I, I think the, I think you're going to really enjoy this one. Absolutely. Insiders, sit back, relax, and enjoy our featured interview with Nick Harcourt. Nick, thank you so much for joining us. I really appreciate it. Yeah, my pleasure. You know, you've had a very broad and diverse uh, background in the industry, but you're best known in radio. How did your uh, career in broadcasting begin? Wow. Well, I'm very fortunate that I managed to get into radio when, uh, well, first of all, there was a lot more radio. And secondly, when it was a a little bit easier to, uh, you know, begin a career, I was living in Australia, of all places. I'm from England originally, but I've been in Australia um, chasing a girl and uh it was time to to move on and i arrived in woodstock new york in the fall of 1988 and uh, at the time i arrived with a a box full of uh, my cds which included a lot of australian artists that hadn't begun to break here in the states yet or perhaps were you know uh, on the underground tip and I, i went to the local radio station in woodstock wdst and uh, knocked on their door and asked if they'd be interested in me doing an Australian show. And uh, I never actually did the Australian show because I I didn't have a work permit at the time. But a a year or so later, I was married, and then I did have a work permit, and then they hired me uh, part-time as a a part-time fill-in guy, and that's where it all started. Wow. Uh, Nick, this is Eric. Thank you so much for joining us. I can't tell you what a pleasure and honor it is uh, to have you on the show. Um, Let me ask you, what is the biggest difference between broadcast radio and other streaming platforms? You know, what makes radio unique and compelling to you? Well, I think it's uh, obviously um, the opportunity to to hear something in, in real time. Uh, in, in many cases, um, a lot of the streaming platforms, if they do have uh, a personality or a curator, they're recorded. The beauty of real radio on uh, transmitters is that in most cases, there are real DJs sitting down in the town where the, where the broadcast is being made and, and speaking to their, uh, their constituency and, and the demographic. And you can't really beat that. That's one thing that radio will always have, which is, you know, locality. How do you feel, I guess this is more of a general radio question because you've been in it a long time and seen it from a lot of perspectives, but how do you feel that radio can meet the challenge of ensuring that younger listeners remain engaged, you know, today? I mean, it's it's sort of an era where media consumption and, and habits of Generation Z and millennials, they're not just audio content, but, you know, a far broader scope that populates the cultural landscape today with DSPs and social media and live events and video content and other things. H- how does radio continually engage people um, today? Well, I think radio has to uh, compete, obviously, in a, a multimedia digital world. And whilst radio stations have the, the, um, the bullhorn of a, of a transmitter, um, they also need to be engaging uh, younger people uh, through uh, technology that younger people use and obviously digital technology and making uh, various things available through uh, websites or other digital portals that the radio stations might be involved with is a way of engaging a younger audience. But I also think it always comes back to that locality thing. You always have to serve, as a radio station, you've got to serve your market. Uh, but at the same time, you can be creating content that can be bringing in people from out of town and and, and across the world. So I think that the stations who are moving with the technology um, are the stations who are going to stay relevant. Absolutely. You you know, you alluded to this earlier in the story where, you know, you started your broadcasting uh, career by kind of talking your way into doing fill-ins at at WDST and Woodstock. You know, this is a two-parter. What was your pitch to them? And the, the follow-up is, how did you know that that was your calling? Because, you know, you, you mentioned that that became the part where you realized your calling. It's almost like everything sort of conspired to, to lead up to that moment. Um, I got in late. I think I was 31 or 32. Um, and I traveled around the world a little bit. I think that, you know, my background, um, my dad was a broadcaster. My dad was in television in the, in the Midlands in Birmingham, which is where I grew up. 
Uh, and, you know, the irony is that I didn't really live with my dad and we don't really have much of a, a relationship, but I guess broadcasting was in the blood somewhere. He was a, a little bit more serious than me. He was a political journalist who ended up in television. Um, but clearly there's a broadcasting background in, in the family. And then, um, you know, my earliest exposure to music was with him when I was a little kid because he would bring home, uh, you know, I've told this story before, you know, he'd bring home the seven inch promo singles in 1962 or 63. And it was the Beatles, you know, she loves you. And, you know, uh, please, please, please me. So my first exposure was to the Beatles. Um, and I had a love of music from, from that moment on. And then through being a teenager and discovering my own music, which was glam, Bowie and T-Rex and, and all that kind of stuff. And then following through into prog rock and then into punk as, you know, my late teens uh, and new wave and, you know, all that stuff that I kind of grew up with. I was a fan. So being a fan of music, um, at some point with that broadcast background, I sort of fluked my way into this part-time gig at DST. I think I mentioned that I originally went and pitched them me doing an Australian show and, uh, you know, saying, hey, I've got all this music from, from down under that nobody really knows yet. And I, I never ended up doing that show. But, uh, you know, back in 1989 or 1990, if you were a warm body and you could, you know, put a couple of songs together for five bucks an hour overnight, you know, you could get a job in the stick. As you were speaking about that story, Nick, it, it reminded me of an interview I read with you in the New York Times where you spoke. It was so poignant when, when your mother told you that your mother and father were splitting and your, your response was, did he take the Beatles records with him? Yeah, I know. It says, it, it says uh, it, it, it's kind of sad, really, but... <laughs> It says a lot about what was going on, I guess, in uh, in my house when I was seven years old. I, you know, I, I want to sort of jump ahead because, you know, after a decade in Woodstock, you came to Los Angeles, I believe, in 1998 as the host of the show Morning Becomes Eclectic at KCRW before becoming the uh, program director for the station. What was that show when you took it over, musically speaking? Um, I came in as the uh, the host of that show and the music director of the station. The station is half music and half news and current affairs. So I was effectively program director of half of the station responsible for all the music shows. And uh, the flagship music show was Morning Becomes Eclectic, which is a, a freeform radio show where I had the opportunity to really spread my wings and try uh, putting lots of different styles of music together, which is something that uh, I'd never really done before on, on the radio. Um, but when I got there, uh, the show had been hosted for seven or eight years. Uh, before me by a guy called Chris Dorita, who had uh, shifted it a little bit from the guy who'd done it before him. Uh, Tom Schnabel had done it back in the uh, 80s and introduced world music to, to America in a fairly significant way. And then when Chris took the show over, he became uh, a little bit more on the alternative uh, side of things. And then when I came in, um, you know, everybody brings their own thing to a show like that. And I just brought whatever my sensibility is from you know, my years of listening to, to music. And I think I perhaps brought a, a little bit more of an um, uh, accessible uh, mix to, to the music. But at the same time, I'd, be, I'd quite happily, you know, play a Miles Davis track or introduce a band like Sigur Rose amongst all the, uh, the other stuff as well. So that's pretty much it. I'm, uh, you know, I'm really fortunate I got to do that. It's a, a great opportunity for, for me, uh, both as a, you know, a music lover and then, uh, you know, in career-wise. Yeah, what a great show. Um, you were the first or one of the first to play the band Coldplay, you know, the Doves, Nora Jones, and so many other unique artists. What is your criteria or process for evaluating the songs that you will eventually select to play on the radio? Well, back then, um, it's a little different now because I'm not programming a show so much anymore. Um, but, but back then, I would, you know, listen to three or 400 CDs a week. Um, and if something just struck me as being a little different um, than anything else that I was hearing, that was usually going to be something that I was going to pick to put on the radio. I'll give you the best example, I think, is with Nora Jones, as you mentioned. Um, because with Nora Jones, um, you would never have expected in um, 19... Well, was it maybe it was 2000, 2001 or something like that? You would never have expected to hear um, that kind of music on the radio. 
And I remember when I, when I remember when I first heard that there was an EP that she had done, and we actually first met her on on KCRW when she came in for a live session with the the jazz guitarist um, Charlie Hunter, uh, and he put he put an album out, and she sang on a couple of the the songs, a couple of covers. I think one was Roxy Music, and I can't remember the other. And then we got her EP, and I remember listening to it and thinking, can I put this on the radio? Is this going to work? And whenever I used to have that feeling or ask myself that question, that usually meant that, yes, you have to yeah. do it. Yeah, what tremendous success you had out of that. Yeah, so to, to, to answer your, your, your question in, a, in a, uh, a, a bigger way, you know, simply being able to uh, hear something different and decide, I want to play that on the radio and see if other people agree. You know, when you came here, Nick, you, you came from, did, did you know Los Angeles at all? Or was it totally a new market geographically and culturally to you? Totally new. Totally new. So, you know, I'm curious. I mean, you, you made such a huge impact uh, at your, during your time there. And, you know, and it was also a very interesting time in the business. What, when you were at uh, KCRW and you were programming, what tools did you rely on or get to use to get a sense of what your listeners wanted to hear? Well, I'll, I'll, I'll be quite frank to you. I've never done any research in my life. Um, I'm not somebody who believes in that. I'm the old school of, you know, trusting your gut and uh, believing that uh, there are a significant enough amount of people who will who will go along with you. And, you know, fortunately, I've been successful at that. Um, so there were no real tools. Um, what I will say is that um, obviously mo- moving into Los Angeles, it's very different from Birmingham, where I grew up listening to, you know, Beatles and Black Sabbath. And uh, um, I, I asked questions. You know, I asked people who were L.A. residents uh, about the local music scene, and I was uh, educated a little bit in in Latin music in particular by my producer at the time, Ariana Morgenstern, who is of Argentinian descent and uh, speaks Spanish and was um, uh, much more aware and obviously um, involved in the, the local music scene, including the Latin alternative scene. So she introduced me to that world and that felt like something I wanted to introduce into the mix. And, you know, I'm proud to say that in a town that is, you know, 50% uh, Latino, we were the only radio show featuring new Latin music. Yeah. And uh, And I remember because, yeah, I remember you were working with Bajo Fondo, which uh, was a band that I worked with at Universal when I was at Universal. And I know you guys, you know, had them on the show because I was there. (laughs) for that so yeah that was incredible yeah so so i sort of you know i asked questions and uh tried to find out and and learn about the town that i was living in and um you know that was really helpful yeah yeah no and it definitely helped you know during this time you became you know literally one of the most influential tastemakers in music where other you know radio program directors film producers music supervisors were looking to the music choices you were making for the station. Were you aware of the impact that you were having at that time? Well, not initially until you are, of course. And I think when I really became aware of it was when uh, I was sitting at home one one night watching television and uh, a commercial came on for Mitsubishi Cars that featured a song by the Icelandic band Goose Goose or Guska that I knew that nobody else would have heard. And I was like, oh, people are listening and, you know, taking taking the ideas here and putting them into television shows and commercials. And, you know, it became um, much more uh, significant over the over the next couple of years when everybody was really tuning in to hear new stuff. Because, again, you know, there, there was no streaming. Um, there was satellite. That satellite was not big at the time. It was before Howard Stern went over there and, you know, saved the, saved the ship. And uh, the creatives in town here, you know, music supervisors, editors, producers, directors, writers, were listening to the show. And we were finding a lot of the music that we were playing ending up in television and film and, and commercials. Nick, during your time at KCRW, you not only had the, you not only elevated the profile of the station, but there was also an element which made KCRW unique in that you had a live component to uh, Morning Becomes Eclectic, which was, you know, the bringing in of bands and adding that element uh, to the, not only the station, but to the music as well. Did Do you feel that that, as a program director, a music director, that that enhanced the relationship of the station to your audience? Well, I think Morning Becomes Eclectic is obviously a, a unique beast. You know, there was no other um, 
format like like that at the time. So what I did with those uh, th- those opportunities, it was basically usually the last 30, 40 minutes of the show, um, is bring in a mix of uh, new bands that we were perhaps exposing for the first time and uh, bringing the audience something that they'd never heard before. And then at the same time, bringing in people who perhaps uh, were already known or legacy artists and them giving us live sessions that would reveal a different side of them. And, you know, when songs are played in a different way, sometimes uh, they they become different. And then the conversations around those songs. So it was something that was pretty unique. and And I think I was very fortunate to have the format in which to do that. Um, I, I think it's I think it's tough to make that work today, and uh, you know, in the formats that we have today. It's interesting to hear you say that. I mean, I, I wonder: do, do you feel that radio is becoming more or less important in the breaking uh, of an artist today? Um, it kills me to say this, but I don't think it is as important as it was. Um, you know, I, I think that commercial radio in general can still play a significant fact uh, factor in uh, you know in taking a, a a commercial artist um, to a, to a huge audience, but they're not really taking the chances. By the time that that song gets onto you know top forty radio, uh, it's already been discovered by, uh, by by a lot of other people. You know, non-com radio, I think, uh, still plays a part in it. But it, again, you know, we alluded to this earlier on in the conversation. People have a lot more choices these days, uh, and from the point of view of discovery, if you are using uh, media for, to discover new music, um, you're probably looking in a, a lot of other places other than listening to your, your local radio station. And we talked earlier on, obviously, about radio having to be uh, cognizant of that and to be able to use uh, digital media, websites, etc., cetera, to, to be able to um, uh, perhaps do things that they, they couldn't do on the, on the regular radio signal. But I, I don't think radio... Uh, in general, plays as big a part in breaking artists, but I think that radio is still a huge part of uh, a significant part of you know taking commercial songs, breakthrough songs to a, to a bigger audience. For the last eleven years, you've been with KCSN, a triple A station uh, out of Cal State Northridge. You know, I'm curious, how has streaming changed the discovery process? Of new music for you? Uh, it's been about eight years. I, I went over there and. Um, I started doing the weekly show over there in the spring of 2011, and then I started doing the morning show over there in the fall of 2012. You know, that station is very different from, from what I was doing at, at, on Morning Becomes Eclectic. It is programmed. Uh, it's a program 24-7 station. It's a non-com station, but it operates in, in, in many ways uh, like a commercial station. Um, I have some freedom within the, the mix of, of what is programmed to the Nick Harcourt flavor uh, onto it, but um, but it, but it's a little bit different. Um, your question, I think, was how how do I think it's been uh, impacted by streaming? Yeah, or, you know, how has it you know been you know influenced? You know, how has it changed? You know, the streaming uh, industry changed the discovery of of the process of new music for you. Has it made it easier for you to find new things? Uh, you know, that kind of thing. Oh, for me personally, yeah. Um, yeah. Well, I I'm, I'm not the um, I'm not the arbiter of cool that I used to be. <laughs> um, so, so I'm not looking for music uh, in the same way that I, that I did back on Morning Becomes Eclectic because the show that I do is very different. Having said that, uh, obviously I am still looking for, for music, just not wading through you know, uh, mailboxes of four or 500 CDs every week. I mean, most of the stuff that I uh, get personally um, that I'm interested in digging into tends to come in, in links. Um, you know, over uh, emails where people will either, you know, send me a, a stream, uh, you know, SoundCloud page or, or maybe something that's on YouTube or uh, wherever it might be living digitally. And uh, I, I do look at the, the press releases that I get because I'm still on a lot of those lists. And if something interests me, I'll tend to take a listen to it and I'll grab it. You know, I'll, I'll send a link over to the the uh, the operations director at the station and have him grab it and load it into the database there. So if I want to play it, I can. And I also host um, there's a couple of new things we started doing over there. One is a, a brand new song every morning at 8.25 called the Fresh Squeeze Track of the Day. And then on Monday, I host a, a just started a couple of weeks ago, a thing called the 9 o'clock news, where I'll pick nine new songs 
uh, and play them at, at nine o'clock on a Monday night. I'm not too sure how many people are, are, are making it appointment listening, but it is the opportunity for me to play nine songs in a row that, you know, don't have to fit uh, a particular format of, you know, recurrent, new, classic, gold, et cetera, et cetera, that we know from, you know, regular fro- programming. But yeah, I tend to get the music coming in through, uh, th- through emails and then people tipping me to stuff. And, you know, I give a listen and grab the stuff that I like. So you were the host uh, of, of the show uh, with Guitar Center, uh, called Guitar Center Sessions on DirecTV. H- how did that partnership come about? But that was a great um, opportunity for me, uh, first and foremost, to learn how to do television um, and be paid. Uh, I'm not sure how good I was in the first couple of episodes, but um, we did 100 episodes over five years. Uh, I didn't book the sh- I didn't book the show. Uh, I made suggestions, but essentially, uh, it was branded entertainment. Guitar Center um, combined with uh, at the beginning, I think it was Panasonic um, and JBL and Direct TV to create effectively branded uh, entertainment or branded content. Um, and Guitar Center had you know their um, the, the the bands that they wanted to or the types of artists that they wanted to appeal to and direct TV had theirs. And there was a combination of, of different artists that would be featured on those shows. They were fantastic shows. I'm very proud of them. Uh, you know, there's a couple that I could, you know, live without, um, from the point of view of, uh, artists, but I won't say what that was, but all in all, um, I got the opportunity to meet and talk, um, in some very in-depth conversations with people that I would never have spoken to on Morning Becomes Eclectic. You know, Morning Becomes Eclectic was fantastic, um, but I kind of got um, pigeonholed as the cool indie guy. Um, and, you know, that's a little limiting because it's a much bigger world than what we were playing on Morning Becomes Eclectic or what non-commercial radio tends to, to play. Um, so when I found myself, you know, in significant deep conversations with people like, uh, Snoop Dogg and Peter Frampton and Merle Haggard and Dave Mustaine and Buddy Guy and tons of other people. You know, my world opened up. Um, my, my professional world opened up in a, in a fairly significant way. And I really learned how to be an interviewer. You know, those interviews would be 45 minute interviews where we would sit down. Basically, what they would do with the show is they would shoot 40 minutes of music, uh, 45 minutes of music and then the same of interview and then they would cut the show together into a one-hour show so it was song interview song interview song interview and the interview segments would be um written in such a way that they fit around the music obviously if we're talking to a legacy artist about a certain song that was important in their career uh because they were going to play it we'd make sure that we talked about that in the interview but essentially those interviews would be like a 45 minute conversation and they could get really deep Um, and for me personally, um, I'm interested in people. So if I can have a conversation with somebody about their process and that process can lead you into all sorts of weird and wonderful places uh, in conversation. So, uh, it was a fantastic experience, but how it came about to be quite frank with you was I was pitching another type of show, uh, around town, a, a live performance interview show. And um, we weren't getting much luck, and we went to Direct TV and pitched the show. And they said, "Well, we don't really want that show, but we have this show, uh, and we've had somebody do the pilots, but we're not really uh, sold on the host. Would you be interested in hosting that show?" And you know, I did an audition, and, and I got the gig. Doing this Guitar Center thing, coming from radio all your life, practically, what was it like? You know, doing television was it a natural progression for you? You know, I think it's always something that people are nervous about in, in radio, going from, from radio to television. And, and I was too. And I, I mentioned at the beginning of our conversation, my, my dad was in television. And, uh, you know, there was a little bit of nervousness around it. But I, I'd had the opportunity to do a couple of things on TV. Um, I'd done, strangely enough, a pledge drive for KCET, uh, Los Angeles um, Public Television Station, um, a few years before. They'd asked me to, you know, be on camera. Uh, that was my first experience. And then I'd also done a couple of things for A&D on their Breakfast with the Arts show. So so by the time I got to, to do Guitar Center Sessions, it wasn't completely new to me. But at the same time, you know, this was real. I mean, we would shoot 10 shows in a week. 
And, uh, you know, it, it took a little while to, to adapt to having somebody in my ear telling me when to stop and start. But, you know, uh, after, after a while, it, it, uh, it worked. And uh, uh, I, was re- I was really lucky, you know, really lucky to get to, to learn how to do TV and get paid for it. You mentioned before that you didn't have, uh, you know, the choice of the artist. So were you told who was going to be on the show? And then you did your research or you prepared for you know, the, the, the conversations that you were going to have? Yeah, uh, the show was booked by Guitar Center and DirecTV. And, uh, you know, in, in many cases, when you're trying to put 10 shows or eight shows together in a week, things come together um, in, in some instances last minute, and sometimes people drop out and sometimes people come in. So it wouldn't be until a couple of months before we were shooting that we would begin the work. And there would be somebody who would do the initial research and pull together all the material and the history. And then we would sit down myself with a couple of the producers and we would decide what we wanted to talk about and then write uh, certain questions out in the way that I speak. Um, But at the same time, uh, they were really only uh, bullet points that we wanted to make sure we got in the conversation. The way I like to do an interview is I, I like to know that I have to get certain things in, but I want I want the freedom to, you know, follow wherever the conversation might go. And, you know, the, the one thing that I will say to people when they say, oh, how, how do you learn how to, do, to, to interview? I say, you listen, you know, you, you know what, you know, some of the things that you want to get from people, but you have to listen because if you're too busy worrying about the next question, you're not listening to what they're saying and you're missing the opportunity to take the conversation, you know, somewhere else. So combination of of research from somebody else and then bringing myself in with producers, outlining what the interview is, and then on the day of being prepared to go somewhere else. But as long as we make sure we hit the points that we want to make so that they will fit in around the songs that are that are being performed. But, you know, some of those best conversations were really when the, the artist showed up and was prepared to go deep. And, you know, magic happens in those moments, you know. Oh, oh, absolutely. Can you share with us who were some of the more memorable or, you know, remarkable conversations that perhaps you you might not have expected? Uh, Peter Frampton, um, one of the one of the first people, you know, in the first couple of seasons. And, you know, I I knew as much about Peter Frampton as most people do, which is Frampton Comes Alive. Yeah. Um, I was aware of uh, Frampton's Camel and I was aware of Humble Pie, but I didn't really know the the details. And as I sort of dug into uh, the research for, for the conversation and then sat down with the man who was totally up for the conversation, um, it was a wonderful conversation. And I could never have thought in a million years that I would uh, interview um, Peter Frampton. And, and, and another one that comes to mind is Snoop Dogg. Um, the, the producers had been wanting to get Snoop for a couple of years. And it had never quite come together. And I was always nervous because, you know, I, you know, I, I grew up in Birmingham. I, it's, it's a little bit different from from where Snoop grew up. And we come at life from different perspectives. So I was always a little bit nervous of sitting down and having a conversation with him. Um, plus, you know, we all know all the crazy uh, stories uh, that have nothing to do with the music. So that was a, a, a one that I was nervous about, but we did a lot of preparation and we sat down for the conversation. We actually did it in Austin, Texas at South by Southwest. We were there a couple of times uh, shooting a couple of shows. Uh, we would go and do three or four shows um, for a couple of years. And uh, we had a, you know, a built a purpose-built studio for the day. And he sat down and his manager came in. And the first thing the manager said to me was, you know, so Nothing about uh, the uh, the prison, uh, nothing about uh, the murders, uh, nothing about this, that and the other. And I'm like, I understand why you're telling me this because you're the manager. But if you know me, you know, that's not the conversation we're going to have. The conversation is going to be about him as an artist and where it came from and the process. And, you know, as I sat down with, with Snoop, who talks to people all the time. I mean, the guy must have had so many interviews, it's ridiculous. We sat down and I I started addressing him with respect for his uh, art. And we had the most marvelous conversation. And he ended up talking about all the things the manager told me not to ask him. So On his own. Yeah. Yeah. It's one of those moments where, where you realize that if you treat people with respect, 
and they feel and they feel safe they'll tell you shit that you would never expect to hear and uh you know i, I would never again in a million years thought oh i'd be having a, a conversation with with snoop that was so good they turned it into an hour and a half episode personally i think it was maybe 10 minutes too long but the bottom line was that the conversation the conversation was deep um it was real and uh who knew Hey, Insiders, we hope that you've been enjoying our featured interview. Stay tuned because we've got so much more value coming your way. But before we dive back in, a word from our sponsor. Hey, Rich, you're the founder, CEO, legend of Music Business Registry. Tell us what the Music Business Registry is all about. Well, what it's about, Eric, is it's a company that is designed to provide the most accurate and up-to-date contact information for the music business. So if someone is looking to reach the A&R community, if someone is looking to reach music publishers, if someone needs to reach artist managers, if someone needs to reach music attorneys, if someone's looking to place their music into film and television and needs to reach all the music supervisors, that's the contact information that we provide. We've been doing it for 28 years. We're sort of the industry standard, if you will, uh, for the music business uh, and, and have been serving them since 1992. So that's what we do. Amazing. So if I wanted to find out let's say, uh, a uh, people from, uh, Warner brothers, let's say I can just go in there and find that in the A&R registry. Absolutely. You'll find all of the Warner brothers in there. You'll find the Warner brothers in LA, Warner brothers in New York, Warner brothers in Nashville, Warner brothers in London, Warner brothers, you know, probably in Australia as well. So those are the, the main territories that we cover. Amazing. And we're offering all of our insiders right now that are listening. If you visit musicregistry.com and use coupon code MUBUTV10 at checkout, you'll get a 10% discount off your first order. That's musicregistry.com, coupon code MUBUTV10. Anything else you want to say, Rich? Well, when you're ready to put your music to work, musicregistry.com. Wow. Well, that must have been very, very exciting. I mean, because it's a whole different dimension in terms... I mean, you know, I, I've been doing you know, interviews and, and panels and moderation and so forth and this kind of thing for years. And it's, it, it's, it, it never, it, it, you do have to prepare. You do have to prepare for it. You do have to have, as you said, you know, the questions and the points and the things you want to get across. But part of it too is also relaxing and, you know, also having faith in, in what you're doing and, and in letting the conversation, as you said before, letting the conversation go to, you know, a direction that you may not have anticipated or even, you know, thought was possible and be prepared to follow that. And the key thing is like what you, what Nick said, and you, you've always said is to listen, yes. to listen, and then that'll take you on the journey. Well, and the, and the other thing is, you know, uh, on a television show, forget there are cameras there, except for when you have to speak to them you know <laughs> right. Uh, right exactly yeah no precisely you know you've always been a champion for great talent and in moving into another element of your career now you've taken on an artist for management and i'm curious what made you want to go into this particular area of the business nothing i ever ever thought i would do to be quite frank with you and had had a couple of opportunities before and uh, declined um look i i have a hard enough time taking care of my own life you know <laughs> right uh, right i I, I figure, you know, A&R and management is, you know, a lot of work taking care of other people. But, you know, the bottom line was I had the opportunity to meet a band around about eight years ago, about the same time as I got over at KCSN, actually. And uh, my friend Jeff Greenberg, who owns the Village Studios in, in West L.A., where I've done a lot of work with live sessions for, you know, TV and radio, um, said that he had met uh, a band that he was going to be managing and would I be interested in working with them to produce them? Um, the band was called Blessed Lestrange and they'd been playing out on the strip and getting a little attention. Um, Jeff had seen them and decided he wanted to work with them and taken them into his studio. And they'd done some demos with a couple of producers over there. They hadn't really found uh, what they wanted. And he asked me if I would be interested in producing. So I'd never produced before. Um, but I, I'm, I'm the guy that if you say, Hey, would you like to try something new that you've never done before? I'm probably going to say yes. And then figure out how to do it. Um, you know, I, I wrote a book a few years, well, a number of years ago now, and it was the same thing. Somebody asked me if I would write a book. Uh, and I was like, I, I have no idea, but sure. Yes, let's do it. You know, you learn how to do something. So Jeff asked me if I'd be interested in producing this band. Uh, I met them, the singer of the band, Keita Klain 
came to my house with her partner uh, in the band at the time. They were the dual songwriters. He played guitar and she sang in my living room. And I was like, you're special. Your voice is amazing and different. And yes, I would like to work with you. And it's, it's sort of, to, you know, I'm going to cut through the chase a little bit. But, you know, we did some demos in the studio. One of them ended up becoming, you know, coming out and being released. Uh, we tracked four songs live in a day. I brought a couple of people in to help. Um, Joaquin Cuda came in and played drums. And as we were in the process of putting those songs together, it became clear to me that this really should be a solo project. And uh, the band went off and carried on doing some stuff for six or nine months and got in a deal that they got out of and then came back to me. And um, I was a mentor at the time and making suggestions about you know, how to go about things. And uh, eventually it became a solo project. And in the absence of finding anybody else to manage, uh, because it's not an easy job to take somebody with no money, no budget, uh, no machine behind them. Um, I stepped in and took on management duties. And, you know, here we are six years later and we're slugging it out in the trenches, you know, but I, I, I feel like I have a special artist with something to say. And, you know, life gets in the way sometimes for everybody. You know, people sometimes have to stop for a while because of, um, you know, personal matters or whatever. But we we've come back and we've continued to, you know, she makes music and uh, finding different people to work with. And we've had a little bit of success with Spotify playlists and we've had a little bit of success with syncs, which are crucial to independent artists. And uh, it's hard work, but I really believe in in Kida and. I know we're going to win. We're just doing the work, you know? Yeah, it, it, you know, it, it's interesting listening to you because, you know, so many of the points that you're making, they articulate a sense of the reality of, you know, what it's like to try to break an artist today. And it's, you know, even I'm, I'm sure you, you, you see this in terms of your own work, is that all those systems that were in place to support talent, to help build talent or to help break talent from the label to the management to agencies to just, you know, culturally within the within the media sphere are gone. You know, it's this kind of, you know, that, 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 that there's an expression that says, you know, the good news for artists is that there are no more gatekeepers. That's the good news. The bad news for artists is that there are no more gates. And 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 and, and as a result of that, it's changed the criteria profoundly of, you know, how do you break an artist today? And, you know, it's it comes down to a fundamental thing of, you know, like what we were talking about before when, when you were speaking about, you know, the role of radio is that just getting people's attention today because we all have so many options is a greater and greater and greater challenge in the media space. And candidly, you know, whether it's broadcast or streaming or whatever, I don't think that that is going to get any easier. As a matter of fact, I... I keep reading that it's going to get more and more and more difficult with more and more players coming into that sphere who are quite significant, you know? So it's just interesting listening to you. I mean, that, you know, you're speaking about somebody who you've been working with, I think, now for six years. Yeah, well, you know, it's uh, all those overnight successes are very rarely overnight successes, as you know. Um, and, and I think that is something that remains the same. As you said, you know, the democratization of... Uh, um, distribution has been fantastic um taking that away from labels and letting people release their own music i think is the best thing that ever happened but at the same time as you said everything is fragmented to such an extent uh that you know getting somebody's attention is is really hard and you know at the end of the day it comes down to a song of course but the song still has to be heard and i always used to say that about my job at morning becomes eclectic is you know i have the 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 bullhorn um, that I can tell people about the music that I'm listening to. I would give people an opportunity to be heard. And one of the first things that Keita ever said to me when I first met her, when I was talking to her and trying to get a sense of who she was, I said, so, you know, what do you, you, know, what do you want to get out of this music that you're making? She says, we just want to be heard. We just want an opportunity, an opportunity to be heard. And that's the difficult thing because there are so many different ways. Uh, and, so, you know, as I said, it's so fragmented. Um, that sure you can get a spin on a non-com radio station, but it's a you know it's a drop in the Atlantic. Right, um, right, yeah. You you've you've really got to be able to hustle on all frontiers, you know. So 
Uh, with Kida, um, we've focused on trying to get music on television um, for Sinks because number one, uh, that keeps her alive as an artist. Um, and number two, if you get a, a, a song played in the right show in the, at the right time, it can make a huge difference. And we've definitely seen how, how that works. You put a song in, it plays in the background. You make a couple of grand, you pay the bills, but the song doesn't really do anything. You get a, a song featured in a two-minute scene in a show that's a big show, that can make a huge difference. So we've been, we've been, we've been sort of working on that angle uh, and then just hustling social media and continuing to put material out, whether it's new material, whether it's remixes. You know, you've got to feed the beast. Yeah. And thank God for things like Shazam, where, you know, if you do dig a song on a show where you can just go ahead and just put your phone to it and know exactly who it is, and then you're immediately off to Spotify. I mean, it's just a great discovery tool. No, we've, we've seen, you know, placements in significant shows where the Shazam goes nuts. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and, as, and as a result of the Shazam going nuts, Spotify goes nuts, the videos go nuts. And you can really see the importance of, uh, you know, television uh, in, in breaking artists. I mean, a few years ago with uh, shows like The O.C. and some of the old WB shows, um, those shows were very significant in breaking artists. So, Nick, you were you were speaking about the element of opportunities and sinks that you had with Kita, and I believe you mentioned a television or an, a television opportunity in Canada. Yeah, I think I was talking about, um, you know, one, one of the things that is really important for independent artists these days is finding other ways um, to to make money, other streams of income. You know, if you get a song on a, a Spotify playlist that gets significant action, then, you know, you can maybe make a little bit of money. But really, um, the opportunities for, for artists to have songs placed in um, commercials uh, and television programs is, is, is really important because it can help pay the bills and give exposure. So Kita had a song called Fingerprints that came out about four years ago that was placed on a Spotify new music uh, playlist when it came out. And as a result of that, was found by a music supervisor in Canada who placed it in a, a commercial for uh, the new Samsung phone on Bell Canada, uh, which at the time was a touchtone phone, so fingerprints worked perfectly. And uh, one of the things that came out of that was, first of all, she got paid pretty well for, for the license. Uh, and secondly, the song got heard uh, all over Canada, and her Shazams were crazy and uh, all, all that stuff. But... A few years later, just recently, last year, the same song um, was used in a, a, a television show called Titans for DC Universe. And DC Universe uh, is a streaming service that actually apparently now is going to be folded into the new Warner Brothers streaming service. But the song was used in a, a very significant scene. It was used in an intimate scene. It played for two minutes. And I keep an eye on what's going on, um, you know, with uh, analytics. Uh, it, it, all, it all sounds very boring, but you kind of have to know what's going on. And wh when that show dropped as a part of a 13-episode uh, bundle, I think, um, her Shazams went through the roof. And as a result of that, people were finding the video on YouTube. People were p finding the song on Spotify. And again, because it's not like the old days where a show was on on Thursday, and if you missed it, it was gone. Um, with all these bundles of shows and people binge-watching stuff, when that series dropped, there was a lot of action um, on those uh, uh, on those various streams and services for about a month. And then here's something else that's funny. So six months later, all of a sudden, I noticed that that song is going nuts again. And I'm wondering what the hell is going on, because you never know. Somebody in Russia might be using it without permission. You know, I'm trying to figure out what's going on. Uh, I called a friend at uh, Shazam who couldn't really tell me because Shazam is part of Apple now and they have things they're not allowed to reveal. But uh, he told me that there was a lot of stuff going on in Latin America. And so through process of uh, digging around, I found out that that entire series, after its six months run on uh, DC Universe, had gone worldwide on Netflix. And so, and so the song had another huge bump for uh, a month or two as people were discovering the show and discovering the song and hitting Shazam. So, so these things are really important. And if, if you can just get that kind of activity for one independent artist, 
you can understand why the, the record labels take this world so seriously now, because they never used to. Uh, publishers have always seen this as a, a stream of income, obviously, and that's their job to monetize uh, the works that they represent. But record labels never really took too much notice of it, and and now it's a it's a very significant uh, revenue stream. Absolutely, and, and and you know, speaking to earlier what we talked about with songs and everything that you know you mentioned about that it's always about the song. What what are the elements that you feel make a great song? And I and I ask you this because you have such a great track record with unique and you know kind of left of center acts. Yeah, um, you know, for for me, a song has to do a couple of things. Um, it has to grab me with some kind of hook within the first, you know, 10, 20 seconds, whether it's a vocal hook or whether it's a, 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 a you know, musical hook. The words have to speak to me somehow, uh, not, necess not necessarily by verse, even if it's just a, a vocal hook, a chorus hook, or it may, you know, it has to make me want to tap my feet. I mean, th for, for me, that's, that's the, the great thing about a song. It either makes me think, it makes me want to sing along, or it makes me want to tap my feet. And I, I don't know if that's, you know, something that we can you know bottle and sell but at the end of the day that's that's what it is for me yeah it, it's 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 something that just resonates i mean i you know we were talking before with a producer who mentioned you know when he was growing up uh, he mentioned a band which i'm sure you're you're a fan of as well called the water boys sure and i remember my first exposure to them was in 1985 when they did the album this is the sea and I remember just being so struck, you know, when I heard Hole of the Moon by, you know, the, the astonishing lyrical element that this guy had, the imagery that he was able to conjure and the emotional impact that those words with that music, it's its like a whole combination of everything, you know, coming together to create that kind of impact because, you know, sometimes people can do it with their, just with their voice rather than even almost what they're saying. I remember the very first time, Nick, that I ever heard... Tracy Chapman sing the song Fast Car and just like it was like arresting just the absolute arresting quality of her voice with that song with those words was just like it stopped you in your tracks. Yeah, I think sometimes you just hear something and you can't quantify it. All, all you can do is say, wow, that's different. That grabbed me. That's something I want to hear again. And if you're in my position, that's something I want to share. You know, that's something I want to tell everybody about. Yeah. You know, do, do you let, let me ask you on that. I mean, do you get that same? Do, do you get as many of those opportunities today? I mean, are you discovering as much music today that you're truly loving than perhaps in, in, in previous times? Or do you find that it's more difficult as time goes on with so many options and so many platforms and so many things coming at you? What, what's your sense on that? Especially, I'm asking you because you're in a unique position, not only from radio, but also being the passionate music lover that you are. Yeah, I, I think, you know, I, I mentioned this before, you know, I don't listen to music in the way that I did when I hosted Morning Becomes Eclectic because it's not my job. It's not my job to get on every morning and do a three hour free form radio show. Right. So, you know, I, I don't listen to music in the same way. Uh, I'm not really doing music supervision at this point either. So I'm sort of listening to music a little bit differently. Um, and the radio show that I do over in, in Northridge at uh, KCSN or 88.5 is, you know, par partially programmed with only a few opportunities for me to sprinkle my stuff in. But, you know, I think that, you know, if, if you're around long enough, uh, at some point you do feel like you've heard a lot of things and you hear things coming back to you that you're like, I've kind of heard that before. You're just reworking something. But, you know, let, let's be honest. I mean, that's been the history of music for, for many, many years. You know, people will take their influences and they will either copy them or they'll do something new with them and, you know, create their own own thing out of it. So I feel like there's great music being made. Um, I, I also feel like a lot of not so great music being made. And, you know, the, the digital technology is a, a double edged sword. Everyone can make music, but right. everyone can make music. You know? Exactly. So, yeah. Um, you know, sifting through it. But I mean, I, I still listen to music with the same enthusiasm that I always did, which is, you know, when I put something on, if I, I find something that somebody's given me or sent to me, I want to love it, you know? And I want to love it because I want to like, tell people about it. Um, so I don't think that's necessarily changed. But as we talked about before, you know, the avenues in which you can share that 
discovery have shifted. How were you able to discern so many so-called diamonds in the rough with the volume of music that you consistently received? I, I wish I could tell you. I wish I had that written down as, you know, step one, two, three, because I'd be, you know, a rich guy. But um, <laughs> I, I, I don't know. I mean, I, you know, I, I think that anybody who has, you know, through good fortune found themselves in the position to be, you know, called a tastemaker, which I always think is weird, but that's the term, um, you know, just has some kind of innate sense of, uh, of, of something that's going to work. And, you know, I, I've always had it. I had it when I was a kid. I mean, mm, I, I, yeah. remember, I, I remember hearing songs when I was 14 and thinking that's a hit. And then six months later, it would be, uh, you know, obviously the world moved a little slower in those days than it does now. But um, uh, I, I just listen to songs and it's either going to grab me or it's not, you know. And I, I got to be honest with you, uh, Rich, I, I've also played songs, plenty of songs that I've thought were fantastic and nobody cared about. So, you know, I, I, I was lucky to have a forum, I think, with that radio show where I could play a ton of different stuff. And, you know, what works, worked. But um, for me, as I, as I said, it's, you know, it's, it's got to get me one way or another, either with a lyric or uh, a beat or uh, a feeling. Um, you know, I, I can remember when I first heard the Damien Rice album. Oh, oh, my God, yes. I remember the emotional impact that had on me the first time I heard it. And I remember I was listening to, you know, a, through a pile of a couple of hundred CDs one Sunday morning in, in my house. And how I would catch up with the music back then was I would set aside a Sunday morning uh, and I'd have the the news up on the computer i'll be you know looking at the news around the world and at the same time i would have a five cd changer and i'll be flipping through all the cds um and usually they got 10 seconds maybe i'd dig in a couple of tracks but you know after a while you learn to trust your instincts and then one day i realized i'm listening to the third song on this cd and hadn't really just sort of noticed i was just listening to it and and all of a sudden i'm realizing oh my gosh, I'm on the third song of this and this is amazing. And, you know, I went into work uh, the next day and I started playing that, uh, that, that album and played, I don't know, probably all of it, five or six songs off of it. And nobody was playing that for a year. Right. It wasn't, it wasn't even out in the States. Right. It was on but, an independent thing that he put out in Ireland. Yeah. He, it was self-release and he was selling a shit ton of records to people in Los Angeles, you know? Uh, and then he came into town and he did three little gigs, uh, you know, like Lago hotel cafe and somewhere else. And, you know, I got to see the power of the, of the format and the power of the show at that time. But I just liked it. You know, it was real simple. It was different. Uh, it got me emotionally, and I, I I played it and, you know, was very fortunate to, you know, have the opportunity to do that and, you know, give him an opportunity to, to find an audience. Absolutely. From your perspective, Nick, what does the future of radio look like to you? Um, you know, I, I hate to say this, but the first word that came into my head was bleak. Mm -hmm. Look, I mean, there are no jobs for guys like me, you know. Um, there are maybe half a dozen jobs for guys like me doing what I do in the non-com world in, in the country, maybe three or four. Um, and, uh, you know, commercial radio has, you know, really just limited its scope. Um, most of the DJs that I knew 20 years ago are doing something else. Right. Um, because, because those jobs have gone. Um, and nobody under 20 is listening to the radio. Uh, there's not that many people under 30 listening to the radio. Um, you know, we started off this conversation. You were asking me, you know, what do you think that, you know, radio can do um, uh, or what radio has that other, you know, platforms don't have. And I think that the only way that radio succeeds is to focus on its on its market, um, super serve its uh it's 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 audience where they live and then at the same time embrace other technologies through um through a website or through you know social media uh you know in los angeles there's a, a public radio station kpcc yeah yep. which 
which is the uh, the NPR, the main NPR affiliate. KCRW takes NPR news as well, but it also does music. Uh, KPCC is exclusively uh, news and current affairs. And, and what they've done is they have focused very intently on local news and not just being a station that plays the NPR shows of, you know, all things considered and, and morning edition, you know, the morning and afternoon shows around that they do a lot of local news. Um, so they are relevant in, in their market as a, a local news option. Um, but at the same time, they've also recently expanded by buying a website called laist.com. Mm -hmm. And they are now using the website to try other things that they wouldn't do on the radio, like podcasts, creating content um, that lives outside of the radio station. But they can promote it from the radio station and they can also promote through that technology they're in the early days over there but I, I know a couple of people over there and i think they have the right approach and you know bruce warren at wxpn in philadelphia with the world cafe you know those guys are spreading out they're doing shows from nashville i know they're thinking about taking their show on the road to other uh stations and affiliates and they're creating content again through through their website and making their programming available through their website so i i think you know radio has to embrace the technology and it has to try and find a way to uh, get into its community and attract a new audience. Because I'll tell you this, and, and it, it pains me to say it, I've been doing this now for almost 30 years. And it's been the love of my life from a, a, a job point of view. Um, but uh, unless radio does that, they're not going to find a new audience. And I was talking to somebody at another public radio station recently. Uh, and... 10 years ago, well, actually, this was probably about five years ago. So 10 years before this conversation, the average age of the listener for that station was 35. And 10 years later, I came and had a conversation with somebody who still worked there. And I said, so what's the, what's the age of your audience now? And he said, 45. And I was like, we're in trouble. Because if, if the audience is aging out um, and no new people are coming in at the bottom, we've got a problem. And I think we've already seen this with the value of radio stations going down, the advertising revenue, et cetera, et cetera. So I don't work in that commercial world. I don't pretend to uh, understand exactly what they do and why they do it. But in the world that I have worked in, um, I, I really believe that radio has to find a way to connect to, uh, to, to its market, to, to be relevant, you know, getting involved in shows, getting involved in, you know, being out and about in the marketplace. Absolutely. Are, are there any great books or movies that have made an impact on you in your life that you could, you know, recommend to our listeners that are interested in pursuing a career in music? Anything that's really touched you or? You know, I, 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 I'm not sure that I can, to be quite frank with you. I mean, there are some, some great movies out there that have featured music that I think are, you know, interesting. Um, you know, obviously Garden State was a movie that, you know, took music and used it as a central character. Um, I think, uh, you know, there's, there's no real great movies about radio stations as far as I can remember. I, I mean, I remember Talk Radio with Eric Lugosi right. years ago. Oh, the Oliver uh, Stone movie, yeah. Oh, my gosh. And, of course, you know, Play Misty for me. <laughs> right, <laughs> on the dark side, but, uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But um, I'm not sure I have the answer to that for you. Nick, for those who, you know, want to pursue a career um, as a radio DJ or a personality, what advice would you have for them uh, in terms of pursuing the career? Well, it's really difficult to get in. Um, I think that, you know, I had the good fortune, as I mentioned at the beginning of this conversation, to be around 30 years ago and walking into a small market radio station where, you know, they were happy enough because I could speak and knew enough about music to stick me on in the middle of the night as a filling guy. But I think that if you really want to do this, regardless of whatever broadcasting degree you, you might get, um, you need to find a way into a radio station. And the best way to do that is to intern. You know, um, if there's a, a radio station in town that you enjoy the music of, and if it's a real radio station that's programmed with DJs there, as opposed to, you know, something that's got syndicated shows, um, you knock on their door and, and ask if you can, you know, volunteer. I mean, non-commercial radio stations will happily take volunteers to exploit. Um, that's one way of doing it. 
Um, but, but really, you've got to get a, an opportunity to get in the door. If you want to be a DJ in radio today, it's very tough. There's not a lot of jobs. But if you want to get into radio as a career and think about it as not just playing songs on the radio, I think there are still opportunities to do that. And it's, it's really, you know, volunteering your, your labor for free. Nick, thank you so much for doing this. I really appreciate it. I love talking to Nick. I, you know, he is one of the most astute, brightest, insightful people on this subject. Um, you know, he, for years, uh, many of us, you know, if you live in Los Angeles, had the privilege of listening to him on a daily basis when he was with KCRW. And that's why I wanted to have him on the show, yeah. because it's an area that we don't really talk about right. a lot. And it's an area, like so many other things, Eric, in the business, is going through a major, major change. Major change. And, and he's legendary. Transition. And he's legendary. He, he is legendary. And he's legendary, you know, for very specific reason, because... Not only as a personality, but as somebody who's a real thought leader, right. who is a real risk taker. And a real curator of great A great real curator and, and a proven track record yeah. with his curation of just such incredible, you know, being the first person, you know, with so many seminal uh, bands and, and artists over the years. Coldplay and... Yeah, Coldplay and, and, and you know, his work with, with uh, in at KCOW with, you know, incorporating with Latin music. Right. I thought that was so interesting how he, you know, when he came to this market that he said he never did research, but one of the things that he did, which I thought was really interesting, was he asked questions, of, questions. of the community. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and he said, and coupled with, you know, working with Ariana Morgenstern, who I think right. you remembered from uh, the, 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 Bajo artist, Fondo the when Bajo I worked Fondo. with the Universal. Yeah, exactly. Is, is he spoke about his uh, immersion into Latin, especially Latin, Latin alternative, alternative, right? For this community. And, you know, 52% of the population of LA County is Hispanic. Right. And Latin. So, Absolutely, you know, and broke a lot of those acts as well. Too. Absolutely, yes. And you, I think, mentioned to him that you were there during the performance, of right? One of, of the of the morning becomes neglected, which was a great, great, great. Exactly. Uh, yeah. Exactly. Um, I thought one of the other uh, areas too that uh, were were exciting to talk to him about was you know was whether radio was more or less important in breaking artists, uh, and I guess it was a two parter, and, and you know, and were some formats more important than others. Well, here's the thing. I mean, when you look at, I guess, you know, radio is not as important as it used to be. Commercial radio, he mentioned, right. is not as important as, as important. it used to be. And, you know, and that's because streaming has become more important. Right. Streaming has become the, mo you know, that's the story that radio goes to before they even add music. Right. But he said in the non-com world, the non-commercial non non exactly. world, it still does play a role. And he talked about the same things that we were talking about, that we just are inundated with a plethora of choices now, that there's almost too many choices. Exactly. And, and that went right to the heart of, you know, what he spoke about with regards to radio's future. Right. That one of the great challenges radio has, commercial radio and even um, non-com radio has, is that it, as a technology, it must, if it's to survive, right, uh, integrate itself with a lot of other digital platforms, you know, for the consumer. Because the consumer, like, like media in general, I mean, right. we talk about this a lot, has so many choices. We have infinite choices today. Right. It's not like, you know, the days where you broke music through getting it on the radio, period. We didn't all listen to the same radio stations, but that's all we listened to was radio. And we had our five or six stations in LA or your two in whatever town you were in. Now it's endless. Endless. And yeah. those choices. Um, I, one of the other real critical areas that I thought was great in the interview when we asked him about, you know, what elements make a great song. Yes. And he was talking about in his personal estimation was, you know, which is typically with everybody else as well, too. But that, you know, he was grabbed with a hook within 10 to 20 seconds, which is typical of songwriting. You know, don't bore us, get us to the chorus. And uh, I thought that, you know, uh, some of the other things that he talked about, that the lyrics have to speak to him, even if it was a phrase within the lyrics or within the chorus, and also something that made him tap his feet, you know. Absolutely. You know, it's the basic elements. And I, I loved what he said about, you know, there has to be something, you know, a great hook. And he said it doesn't necessarily have to be a... Um, 
a, a, a you know a chorus, but there has to be some Something, kind of element right. musically or whatever that grabs him immediately. Right. And the same thing with the lyric that it wasn't necessarily verse, but the lyric had to speak, speak to, him to him somehow. somehow. Yeah. You know, even and if it was through a phrase or something. Exactly. That's like, exactly. Yeah. And you know, it's funny. I remember when I first heard the very first Coldplay album. And there's a beautiful song that that just has this lilting piano, you know, do da 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 and and it it's it's this motif that runs through the whole thing. Not necessarily a chorus or a hit song of theirs, but that's the thing that immediately right. upon grabs hearing you. that grabs you. Right. And I think that's what he was talking about too when he talked about, you know, that that element. Ultimately, I thought that one of the most interesting things he said about the survival of radio. Uh, which I think is very, very true as well. And it's something that I think you and I take to heart in terms of what we're doing with this podcast, is you have to serve your community. Absolutely. You have to serve your community. You have to know what they want, and you have to be able to serve that. And he talked about like the local communities. He mentioned that even with regards to when he took over KCRW as music director, with regards to you know understanding the Latin community right. and being able to serve that. And if you can serve that, much like we've talked about in other, you know, uh, podcasts with, you know, I think one that we did a while back with Pete Anderson. Right. Where he talked about, you know, really identifying a specific community and mining that and really mining the community. Right. Rather than trying to reach, you know, the masses, the community. That is what I think will be. Super serving the audience as we talk about. Super absolutely. That is what I think will be the surviving aspect for radio. Hey, insiders. Thanks so much for tuning into this episode. We really appreciate it. To get show notes, links, and everything that was mentioned during this interview, head on over to our official website at mubutv.com forward slash podcast forward slash show notes. If you're enjoying the content and what we're doing here on the show, please subscribe to the podcast on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, Spotify, or wherever you listen to podcasts from. And don't forget to rate and review our show over at iTunes. Five-star reviews are always welcome and help to ensure that our podcast stands out on the top-rated and new and noteworthy charts on iTunes in our space. You can also find us on social media at Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter, all ending with the handle Mubu TV, which is spelled M-U-B-U TV. Don't forget to catch our flagship show, the Mubu TV Insider Video Series airing every week on YouTube at youtube.com forward slash Mubu TV. This show was produced and created by Rich Ezra and Eric Knight. This show would not be here if it weren't for our amazing team, which are the following. Interview editors, Sarah Nissenbaum and Alex Taylor. Show notes and transcriptions by Jani Chang, Nicole Caboteglo, Lilia Owens, and Sarah Nissenbaum. Theme music by Disciples of Babylon. And be sure to tune in next week for another episode of the Mubu TV Insider Podcast podcast.